Sure. Perfect. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks, Anna, for putting this together, and Josep for uh, inviting me to be to be to be here today. Um, so, yeah, as Jordi said, I'm going to talk about circadian. It's about 30, 40 minutes, right? Yeah. 40 yeah. minutes is nice. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, as Jordi was saying, I'm going to talk about uh, circadian circadian regulation in in photosynthesis and and, and transpiration. And I don't know if you know this. This is the Linne, Linnaeus garden, Linnaeus the, the taxonomy. So, you know, he noticed that different flowers opened at different times of the day due to these rhythms of plants. And so he said that if you plant all these plants in a garden, you know, you, there will always be some flowers that are open in your in your garden due to the circadian the circadian clock. So, the circadian clock, what is that? So that's pretty important in us, right? In in humans, like you know, we take a plane and go to Australia and we spend a few days that we don't really know where we are. Shift workers have all sorts of, you know, problems or they're more likely to get like obesity problems, diabetes, you know, daylight savings time, you know, lots of people hate that we have to change the time twice a year. And that's because we have this uh, endogenous, this internal timing of when, of, of different things that in us, in humans, it's regulating, you know, lots, lots, lots of different processes, you know, like body temperature, uh, bloody uh, pressure, a lot of different stuff. It's actually so important for us and for medicine that in 2017 they, they gave these guys the Nobel, the Nobel Prize in, 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 in physiology and medicine because these guys essentially figured out the molecular structure of the circadian clock in humans. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that more later but let's say that essentially the circadian clock what it does is that it uh, alters the temporal pattern of transcription and in, in us, it's very important, but it only affects about 10% of the mammal genome. You know, it's really important for us humans that it only affects 10% of the mammal genome. In plants, where we would normally think it's not that important, at least not from an ecology perspective, it actually regulates the temporal transcription of 30% of the genome. So it potentially it's important three times, it's potentially three times more important than in plants, than in humans. Another interesting thing about this circadian clock is that it has been preserved through evolution, presumably over hundreds of millions of years. Uh, Mosses, people that sort of look at genomes and they look at the genome of, of Fiscomitrella, sort of the, the model species for, for mosses, they have found that there's a circadian clock in them. And people working with Arabidopsis, they have found that this clock is actually a, a more complex version of this early clock of mosses. So, this indicates, they take this as an indicator that it's not that circadian clock has been lost and then come again. No, no, it's actually been preserved through evolution. It just uh, encountered more um, developments as, as it moved uh, through evolution. So, what does this circadian clock do? So, the circadian clock, what it does is that it creates a self-sustained evolution, uh, self-sustained oscillation. So if you put a plant or us under continuous uh, conditions of light, temperature, humidity, everything constant, you'll see that processes under circadian regulation go up and down. They have an oscillation that is self-sustained, that is, it happens when the environment is constant, and the period is about 24 hours. It's never by 24 hours, it's almost 24 hours. This circadian clock is entrained by light and temperature. This means that the clock gets on time every day based upon light and temperature that it has experienced. And it can be phase shifted. So we have plants in a cabinet and you know they're growing in dark light, dark light, and then you switch that. When it was dark, you give light, and when it was light, you give dark. It will take a few days, but the plants will adjust. It's what happens to us when we go to Australia or Japan or whatever. Do we get phase shifted? It takes us a few days. But it can, it, can be, it can be adjusted to new conditions. So processes that meet this criteria, we call them that they're under circadian regulation. And essentially, the way this circadian clock works is that it has like an input pathway. It's a very sophisticated way that plants can, based on light and temperature, it's sort of providing the information on time of day to the oscillator. The oscillator is where we have the core circadian rhythms. Um, the, the, it's the core, os the, the core control of the, of the circadian clock is the oscillator. It's a very complex genetic network. The model of how this works has been changing through time. The current version, they call it the quadrirepressilator. Can't believe I said that, right? Uh, so it has these four modules of works of genes that with the quadri side of it and these genes they each of them gets active at different times of day 
And when they do, they repress the activity of the other. That's why the repressilator part of it. So the arrows ending like that means that it, the expression of this gene inhibits the expression of this other gene. So some of these genes activate at night, sorry, at night, some of these activate at day, and so on. And so it's the interplay, the, 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 the connections between these genes that create the oscillations in the, in the core of the circadian clock. And then this leads to a certain output. This then uh, has, has effects on metabolism. And the way that happened, the main one, is because some of these genes are actually transcription factors. So if they're oscillating, anything that they're going to be transcribing, their expression is also going to oscillate. Uh, well, it also controls lots of transcriptional processes. Uh, some hormones, like abscisic acid, for example, they're also controlled by the clock. So everything downstream, everything that ABA regulates will be controlled by the circadian clock, such as tomorrow conductance. And calcium, which is a very important messenger, is the concentrations of calcium are also have also have circadian oscillation. So anything that depends on calcium is likely to have a circadian rhythm into it, because because of this. Okay. I think that's the most boring part of the of the talk so far, or at least the one that's going to be most difficult to understand for those of us who don't work with molecular with molecular stuff. Um, yeah, output. Lots of things are under output. Like gas exchange, photoprotection, lots of different processes are under, are under the circadian clock. As I mentioned, it's like 30% of the genome has been affected. It's affected by the circadian clock. It's, you know, a very complex structure. I just spent a bit of time describing the oscillator, but the way the input pathway works is also very complex. The output pathway is also very complex. It's also been preserved through hundreds of millions of years through evolution, and it regulates many metabolic routes. So, so why do plants have a circadian clock into it? I guess there's lots of different possible explanations for it. One is that plants think it's fun to have an oscillator. You know, maybe it has no function at all. Maybe it's ha it, it, it has all this complex structure that's preserved through evolution, and, you know, after all, most of us plant ecologists have never worried about that. Maybe it's not important. The other, the, another possibility is that it actually, might, it, maybe it is important for the plant, maybe it has some fitness consequences for the plant, and therefore for the, for the ecology of the plant. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, about whether this clock is important, or maybe just important at the molecular scale. It doesn't affect at the organismal scale, or, or so on. So that's sort of the framework of, of the talk, especially I'm going to be talking about, about the circadian regulation of, of, of gas exchange. This is a modified version. So about 10 years ago, Giuseppe invited me here to, to give a talk, and I presented a modified version of this slide. I'm sure you all, you all remember this one, right? <laughs> uh, well, it's just looking at the microarray. Just essentially what this is showing is that the, the genes uh, related to photosynthesis are activated in, the, in Arabidopsis, in this, you know, this weird plant that all molecular biologists, biologists look at, but that they were sleeping in the in the mutant the mutant didn't have a circadian clock into it in the wild type they were all activated and this is because it was one hour before the lights were turned on so one hour before the lights were turned on like a normal plant is already telling its photosynthetic machinery to wake up it's time to work whereas in the plant that doesn't have a circadian rhythm into it they were still sleeping because they didn't have a clue that the sun would come up in in, in about one hour we've known that for for many for many many for for a few years you know Circadian clock regulates the transcription of photosynthetic genes, uh, also stomatal conductance, and also these affects the leaf level fluxes. So does this matter at, 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 at field scale? Oh, so then the other slide I put in 10 years ago is that I told you that then my, this would be sort of my next steps that I could, I could do. I think I lied, I have to admit I lied, I haven't done anything about these, these two aspects. I've been concentrated on looking at the circadian implications at, at larger scale processes. So whether, so whether circadian regulation affects in gas exchange affect uh, canopies and ecosystems, how, what does that mean for us that are trying to scale processes or model processes, what, what does that mean, and whether it actually has a fitness advantage to have a, to have a circadian clock. Am I going too fast? Okay, good. So, a bit? Yeah, I have a tendency to go fast, that's why that's why I'm asking. I'll try to, to slow down and remind me to, to slow down if I, because I will forget in 30 seconds from now. Um, does circadian regulation affect whole canopies or whole ecosystems? So this is an experiment that we did in, in Montpellier. They have these Ecotron, these very nice facilities. So inside of these domes, you, can, you have a lysimeter. 
So we had like two meters of soil and it's sitting on an lysimeter, which is going to be weighing the, for transpiration. Uh, we put half of the chambers, we had cotton, the other half we had beans. That way they were covered because we were doing the experiment in one species at the time. I think here this was with beans and this was cotton. And here we're measuring fluxes real time. So with the lysimeter we can get real time transpiration. And then with, you know, the ear gas and the picarros we can also get isotopes. But well, we're getting, at, at this ecosystem scale, or at this macrocosm scale, we're getting um, data on CO2 and water fluxes. And we were covering it so we wouldn't get any external output of light. All the light is controlled by us. We had some lamps. So we could control all the environmental variables, light, and also temperature, relative humidity, and, and so on. And so this is like the pattern for a normal day. For a normal day at the leaf scale, uh, you have your assimilation going up and down, or down and up, and your conductance going up and down and up. And this is because, you know, it's just an, it's a day we started at noon, and, you know, temperature goes down during the night, and then it goes up again. So photosynthesis, that's what you're supposed, that you, what you expect it to do. No photosynthesis during the night, then there's photosynthesis again during the day. And the same with, with thermal conductance. Um, then, what we did for the next 48 hours was that we kept the environment constant. This is called free running in circadian terminology. What that means is that temperature is constant, VPD is constant, and light is constant. This, everything was lighted, okay? But this thing here means that it would normally have been dark. It would have normally been night. It's the subjective night. This means that it would have normally been day, it would have normally been night. So what happened was that the leaf scale for both species we observed an oscillation that had a period of more or less 24 hours in the moral conductance as well as in photosynthesis. The oscillation in the moral conductance over a 24 hour period was about 70% as the one that you normally have. So the moral conductance you know, normally goes from here to here. This is 70% of this, okay? Uh, this is 24 hours oscillation. If we look on the uh, daytime oscillation, it's about 30% of the oscillation that you have during daytime, okay? Photosynthesis, we also have this self-sustained oscillation with a 24 hours period. The oscillation was smaller. It was about 20%, 25%. That's at the leaf scale, but we already knew that. Would we observe also at the canopy scale? Um, we did. The, well, don't mind the colors, it's just when the color is yellow, it means that the slope is not significant. But the, the important is that, one, that each color means a species, and the yellow bit just means that the trend, the slope is not significant, because we took the derivative and so on. So what we saw at canopy scale for assimilation and for transpiration was pretty much the same as what we observed at, at leaf scale. So the process did uh, go up in scale from leaves to canopies to affect uh, net um, canopy assimilation, okay? Then we collected more data from the literature to try to see how universal this response is. So, you know, we looked at the Web of Science papers and these are all the species that for which we could find data. And what we observed was at leaf level, so circadian levels, uh, rhythms are responsible for about 15 to 25% of the oscillation that you get normally during your day. You get, normally we attribute 100% of the variation during the day to temperature, light, blah, blah, blah. So we have a control where we keep everything constant. We still get 15 to 25% of the oscillation in photosynthesis and a bit more for stomatal conductance, 30 to 35%. That's driven solely by circadian rhythms. Uh, while I was in Sydney, we had these um, chambers, whole tree chambers. This is a, a eucalyptus. And here we could not control light, but we could control temperature and humidity. So what we did was that we worked at a portion of the day where the light phot saturates photosynthesis. So having more light does not affect the tree anymore because photosynthesis is saturated. We looked at what happened with a day with temperature constant and another day with VPD, VPD changing and temperature changing and we observed the, sort of the same pattern. There was a, an oscillation in, in photosynthesis and another oscillation in transpiration and the oscillation, was larger in trans, the oscillation was larger in transpiration than in photosynthesis. We took some medical variance data uh, across, uh, across um, 
North America, well, going from Brazil all the way to, to Alaska. At the ecosystem scale, it's very difficult to do these manipulations. So instead of keeping a tropical forest under constant humidity and so on, that could have been challenging, what we did was to apply a series of statistical filters. So, you know, your relationship between um, uh, photosynthesis and light is sort of asymptotic. You just keep the asymptotic part of it and you do the same with all the drivers. Temperature, relative humidity and so on. So you can, as a way of trying to knock out any environmental effects, and so that's, that's, we got, that's what we mean by filtered NEE, okay? These edicovariance towers, they're sort of measuring net ecosystem exchange. So the balance between photosynthesis and respiration at, at whole canopy. We apply a lot, of, a lot of filters to that data. And across all the different biomes, at most of them, we observed that there was a, a circadian pattern to it, or, an, or a pattern that could not be explained by the environment, at least. So it seems that this circadian regulation is, is widespread in different biomes, from leaves, the whole trees, to biomes, to, to, to ecosystems, we're seeing a consistent pattern of this endogenous regulation in, in photosynthesis. So what? Cool, that's cool, but what does that mean? Does circadian regulation interfere with you know, the way we're scaling processes, with the way we're currently modeling? So how do we, how do, we do this, this scaling stuff? So one of the things that we do is that we have this top-down approach where we measure uh, ecosystem fluxes and then like here with an edicovariance variance tower we measure ecosystem, ecosystem fluxes and then we try to scale them down by looking at the correlation of the flux with uh, light, vapor pressure deficit, with our temperature and so on and we get and the correlation is going to tell us the effect that light has over photosynthesis, the effect that VPD has over NEE and so on, we infer this, this, the effect of VPD over NEE, we infer it from the correlation between both and so on. There is, there is a problem, well that's, that's the way we do when, when, when doing the downscaling, and then when we're doing the upscaling, we're doing, we're measuring you know, all sorts of mechanistic curves and then if using the variation in the environment to sort of extrapolate it to the, to the rest of the day. There is a problem with doing this, or at least an assumption, and is that no process creates temporal variation in fluxes in the absence of variation in the environment. So when we are doing this, here we're, 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 we're assuming that time by itself is not affecting the fluxes, because this VPD, we're only gonna have it, you know, probably at 2 p.m. or something like that, we're only gonna have this VPD early in the morning or late in the evening, the same applies for light, we're only going to have this light at certain periods, we're only going to have this light at certain periods, and so on. So here, when we're scaling, we're assuming that there is no circadian rhythm to it. There is no process that creates temporal variation in fluxes other than the environment. So is that true? So usually you're going to do whole ecosystem manipulations. You need an ecotron for that, and you do them at least at macrocosm scale. And so what we did is that we measured, this is like a normal day where your temperature goes up, it went up, in this case we made it go up from 15 to 30 degrees. This was under low light, so we had photosynthesis going down, it was, well, low light, it was 500 micromoles, but this is why the fluxes go down, probably. We got a 22% decrease for both species, as temperature and VPD went up from 15 to 30 degrees, and from, what, like 0.5 to 2 kilopascals, Photosynthesis went down by 22%. We, we looked if this response was driven by a direct response to the environment alone. So here we ramped up very quickly temperature and vapor pressure deficit. We increased the temperature and the vapor pressure deficit very quickly in one or two hours. And what we observed was that instead of a 22% decrease, we actually observed a 37% decrease, almost twice as big which is telling us that there's something else maybe going on. We cannot explain variation in, the, in a normal environment, we cannot explain it based upon this response curve, which is the way we normally do. So what's going on? Well, we think that this is because of circadian regulation, because, and sorry, the scale here is different, but if we look at what happens during this period of time, during this period of time, we actually have a 13% increase. So, if you do 37 minus 13, that's 22, sorry, that's 24, but 24% was not statistically significant from 22%. So, 
with the best evidence that we have at the moment, we consider that the effect that the clock has is an additive effect with the, with the direct effect of environmental forcing on fluxes. We didn't find evidence for any interactive effects. It was just purely an additive effect. We don't have a lot of data. That's the only experiment that I know that has tested this. So, you know, we cannot, gener gonna, we cannot generalize, generalize this. But this is telling us that one of the fundamental assumptions, at least for this case, that we're doing when we're scaling flux is it, it had some problems. It had a 10% error, 13% error. And that's what, what we see here. So we compare the downscaling with the upscaling. So the downscaling means that I correlate fluxes with temperature and VPD. This is what, what means downscaling. And upscaling means that I do the uh, response curve. We get different results. If we do a downscaling correlating fluxes with environment, we got this effect of VPD on a simulation, this effect of temperature on a simulation. If we do an upscaling, so if we do temperature and VPD response curve, we get this other effect this other effect. Okay, so it, depending on how you're scaling fluxes, you're gonna get a different environmental dependency of photosynthesis because the clock is gonna be messing you up. Okay? So then, we, we did some, some, some models. Uh, that was only for, for stomatal conductance. These are different stomatal models. Those of you who are familiar with, with stomatal models, so this is Medlin, Leoning, or Bulberry. And if you're not familiar with stomatal models, don't worry. Just know that they have, they just vary basically in the way they interpret, they, they model the environment, the dependency of moisture, the dependent of, of, of stomata on, on, on moisture and VPD. G0 is a model, is a feeding parameter. It's sort of the, the intercept. And oscillator means that these models had a circadian oscillator built into them, into them, and these models did not have a circadian oscillator built into them. So these are the R square, the Akai criterion, and so on for all of them. What's important here is what's in bold, and, and the best models were the ones that were always with a circadian oscillator. So what are each models? Here we used all the data for calibration and all the data for validation. Here we use the data under changing conditions, so the first 24 hours, for calibration and the data under constant conditions that 48 hours for validation. So when we use this data to calibrate and this data for validate as tomorrow model, the best fit includes the circadian oscillator. When we do the opposite, when we use the constant, the constant phase to calibrate the tomorrow model that we validate upon the changing phase, we also get that the best model is one that includes a circadian oscillator into it, the one that has the highest R square and lowest Akaike. And the same when we used all the data set for calibration and, and validation. So we, we, we observed some model, uh, some increases in model goodness of fit when doing that. So this is the, the result of a, of, a, of a global synthesis. This is based upon Belinda Medlin's uh, stomatal model. And so they have this parameter called G1. It's a feeding parameter. Um, they claim it's related to well, marginal uh, Water use efficiency, that's not important at this point. It's a, it's a feeding parameter. Um, and they wanted to see if there would be differences across in, in G1 across functional types, because that's a way that you can then improve your models. You can put a different G1 for each functional type. And that's a way that you can try to get more accurate um, fluxes. And yeah, there, there were significant differences in, in this parameter G1 across, across functional types. What's interesting is that a large part of this variation, so you know, variation here goes from two to eight. A large part of this variation also occurs within one day. When we put plants under constant light, constant temperature, and so on, and we look at the variation in this fitting parameter that's related to marginal water use efficiency, to marginal, to marginal water cost, uh, we saw that a substantial part of, the, of, of this variation occurs within, within one day. About two thirds of the global variation in G1, you can see it within one day. So that probably has also some, some implications for, for modeling that way. So is it adaptive or not? Um, why do plants do this? It's difficult to test this. There's lots of talking about it and it's, it's really difficult to, te to test for this, or at least I find it, I find it difficult. Um, 
we're hypothesizing that one of the reasons why the clock is adaptive, there's, there's others, but one of the reasons why the circadian clock could be adaptive is because it anticipates highly predictable environmental cues. I showed at the beginning that graph with the microarray showing that uh, the photosynthetic genes were on before turning the lights on, saying that the plant was anticipating it, so it was time to, to wake up. So that could be one of the reasons for, for this pattern. So, one of the processes where you see a strongest circadian regulation is actually in nocturnal stomatal conductance. Um, we have estimated between 30 and 50 percent of the whole variation in nocturnal stomatal conductance during a night is driven by, by the circadian clock. And this, this, circadian, this nocturnal circadian conductance is quite widespread across different functional types. So this is the ratio of nighttime to daytime conductance across, across different functional groups. So it goes more, more or less from 20 up to you know 60 70 percent hemiparasites vary a lot more but that's because they lose water like crazy but for for most plants that are not parasites it varies between 20 or 60 percent and circadian clock regulates regulates a lot of that we we have lots of evidence going from from leaf level also to 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 whole tree level that sort of in these whole tree chambers what we did was that we kept temperature and humidity constant this was nighttime period so we didn't have to worry about light and we see conductance, you know, it's sort of going up as the night advances. And that was not driven by VPD. Or there, are, there are different processes that can explain this initial decline of, of stomata. It might be driven to stomatal kinetics and so on. But the only mechanism that can explain this increase in, in stomatal conductance that I'm aware of is sort of circadian, circadian regulation. Uh, we also measured subflux here in the only subflux data that I ever collected. And we also saw it at the whole tree scale with subflux that there was a, a, an endogenous rise in, in subflux, probably driven by this endogenous rise in, in stomatal conductance. And then we looked at variation across different genotypes. Um, so these are six different genotypes of, of eucalyptus. And their conductance also increases from early night to late night. Their stomatal, the, the stomatal conductance also increases in a process that's driven by the clock. And what was interesting was that the clocks, the, 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 the genotypes that had higher stomatal conductance late at night, they ended up, they were also the ones that were fast, fast growers. Fa th they were growing the fastest. We think, and you know, that's a bit hand wavy, we still don't have it fully worked out, but that, that could be because higher genotype means that, you know, you we, we, like, we actually measured this. The ones that had higher predon stomatal conductance, they were responding faster to the light. Those stomata were open more quickly. They also opened at higher levels. Then they had higher whole plant photosynthesis, and that led to, to, higher, to higher biomass. That's a bit flaky, but I mean, we're still, we're still trying to figure this out. Uh, interestingly, uh, when we did this meta-analysis, we looked at a bunch of data from, from the literature, and we saw a significant correlation. Oh, sorry, I'm, I didn't put the figure, but I mean the legend, but every color is a, is a different functional type. We also see a significant correlation between growth, relative growth rates, and nocturnal stomatal conductance. And we looked at all the processes that could explain this, um, and there are different hypotheses that, you know, having more open stomata means that you're flowing more nitrogen. Um, it could also be related to simply um, having more, um, more uh, higher respiratory, respiratory flux, uh, having more, more CO2 in your stream, that means that you might run into some oxygenation problems, so that could be why, why the, op the stomata are opening to release, to, to release this CO2 build up. We looked at that, uh, all sorts of processes, and, and the only one that seemed to explain this relationship was this endogenous rise in, in, stomatal, in stomatal conductance. At least it was the only one that was related to. This endogenous rise in stomatal conductance, so the increase in stomatal conductance from early night to, to late night. It was the only one that was apparently ex explaining this. So I guess I'm a bit short, but sort of to, to wrap up, um, circadian regulation, you know, it precedes many key adaptations. You know, these days we think, you know, fire is very important and so on, but you know, plants had a circadian clock before they had experienced any fire. They already had a clock into it. It affects about 30% of the genome. You know, we think of fire, drought, they have a big effect on plants, but remember those things are very, uh, at least to some, to, some, to, some, to, some, to some degree, they're unpredictable, or at least they have a random component into it. Nothing is more predictable than photo period. It varies deterministically with space and time. And so the clock is nothing but an adaptation to that. 
So we found that you know, circadian gas exchange seems to act across skills. Um, we're not taking that into account. Uh, maybe it's adaptive by allowing plants to anticipate to environmental conditions, but I think you know we still we still don't know what the reasons. I think we still not, we need a lot more work to sort of understand the the ecological the ecological function of of the clock. This really is is just at the at the at the beginning. Um, yeah. So, and with that, uh, with acknowledging the funding and the collaborators, I'll open it up for for questions if there are some. Thanks. Well, I was not expecting respiration to be under circadian regulation, but we actually did observe in, in the nighttime fluxes, we also observed. It was, it was much stronger in the um, in light enhanced dark respiration. It might have something to do with malate cycle. We didn't get to measure that. But there was a fairly significant oscillation in, in light enhanced dark respiration. But when we kept the thing under constant conditions for a couple of days, it was also oscillating. The, the respiratory flux was also oscillating. Leaf and microcosm. Well, but there's also there's you know there's the cock effect. There's lots of things about 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 doing about that effect in, in itself that, that that has problems. Um, the question is whether whether or not it, it will scale. Whether or not it, it will scale at, at that point. And and I cannot uh, you know at some point I for the data that I looked at I looked into the cock effect and for the data that I work with it didn't scale up at the at the ecosystem level. So I don't know if circadian regulation, it, it, I would have to do it. It could have a problem, but I don't know if it's going to scale up for that particular process or not. Victor, yeah. Thanks for your talk. Yeah, and in, and in fact, it's a very interesting topic. We all know that one of the biggest contrasts that uh, li living beings can have to, to deal with is day and night. So you, you chose a, a really interesting Thanks. Yeah, really interesting. But, uh, let, let me see. There's plenty of questions, and we'll talk later, I guess. But uh, for example, why do you why do you uh, pay such an attention to calcium and not to potassium, for example? When you try to explain uh, the effects, when potassium has a mass uh, charge, uh, that seems even better to to become the regulator. Right, right. Um, that's not me. <laughs> that was like a review of the literature. I, I agree with, with what you're saying, sort of the introductory part. It was sort of a review of what people say about it. I agree that calcium probably has, has, a, has a big role into it. So I've been more worried about what happens like from the leaf and above, not within the leaf to this point. Well, regarding then your experiment, then the other thing is, having your experiments when you submit to an abrupt shift in conditions is because they are stress and not gradual ones. So you try to, to figure out the, the additional effect of circadian dream. So you're talking about this? Yeah. yeah. Are, are, are you afraid that maybe there is uh, something related to yeah, I was afraid. So we did this over two hours period. You know, it wasn't five minutes, it was two hours. So yeah, so this is one hour and this is the second hour. So we, we tried to avoid that artifact. And then, and then going, yeah, I, I immediately, but uh, and we will talk later. But uh, the other thing is, instead of uh, fixing our attention now to one hour, let's go uh, to uh, phenology. You know that we work hard on that. So what would you advise us to do? Technological studies based on what you know at the circadian rim. Instead of uh, working at the circadian rim, we work at the seasonal and annual rim. Is there any uh, similarity that you would suggest us to consider? Well, it depends on the phenology of what. Um, I guess if you're, you're talking like leaf flashing and, and, and so on. So look, right now, we I didn't want to show the data because we're working this up and there might be mistakes. We've been doing weekly measurements of stomatal conductance in a bunch of different oak species. And for, for that, we found that the, actually the, um, they, was, they were growing in pods and so on in Zaragoza. And the, if you look at the seasonal pattern, 
of stomatal conductance is actually correlated better with, um, with day length than with VPD. There's different processes. We actually, with people that do manipulation experiments, they also see that the stomata are more closed in short days and they're more open in, in long days. You know, long days is signaling the plant to grow, short days is signaling the plant to shut down, the winter's coming. And so there's some, some mechanism for that. Um, you know, the module, the constant, uh, constant flowering locus T module, so the regulating phenology in, in populus, it appears to also be working at the guard cells. And so that could be sort of the mechanism for this seasonal regulation of, 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 of tomato conductance. In terms of uh, the phenology of leaves and, and buds and so on, I, I, I haven't really been, been looking into that. Um, what, my, what I would do is to look at the effect of different photoperiods. I mean, you guys have that paper where you claim that the phenology is not advancing that quickly, and maybe that's because of photoperiod limitations. And, and in a way, I, 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 I view as, as the, the temperature is sort of the revolutionary part of the, of the plan, and the circadian clock is sort of the most conservative one, right? That's, in my mind, that's how I, how I view both things. You know, it's like Podemos versus Pepe or something like that. When it's telling the plant, you know, slow down, don't just go crazy because it's getting hot, there's still the photoperiod. And I guess, you know, it's do some experiments on their growth chambers to sort of test this hypothesis. Because I don't think we have much, yeah, everything comes from experiment, from monitoring and so on, and that's very powerful. But I think we need the combination of experimental manipulations that also have limitations. But I think that's a way to tease up whether those photoperiod limitations could actually be playing a role in phenology. Yeah. Thanks. Well, after so we took measurements here for 30 minutes and here for 30 minutes. So after these 30 hours, we, the data we report is the data of after 30 minutes of acclimation, mm -hmm. which I didn't mention before, and I probably should have. But you didn't so. test other uh, velocities of the change. I mean, instead of two hours, we same change in 30 minutes, or in five hours, testing whether the slope of the response. No, we didn't. We were, we were, we were limited because it, the, the, we did more tests. Uh, we did some we only had temperature instead of having, yeah, we kept, we kept VPD constant. So we were playing with humidity. The thing is that between this experiment and this experiment, we allowed for six or seven days. You know, you need to put the plants under five normal dark light cycles to have it entrained. And then we were very careful in that sense. And, and you know, it was at the end of another experiment. So we, we essentially ran out of time. It takes about, you know, one month to do this experiment. So we, we, couldn't, we couldn't do that. We, we were, I, I, I. Making sure whether it's added to the node. I know, yeah, I, we, we need a lot more data on this. It's, I wouldn't believe that this is as gospel. I think this is just one experiment and we need more to, to, to see what's going on. I think it's, you know, impressive. I mean, it, <laughs> that it just matches. <laughs> it, you know, it was nice for me writing the paper, but it doesn't mean that it's always gonna be like that. And we really need more tests on, you know, different velocities, all different, you know, doing ex manipulations when light is limiting. I mean, when light is not limiting at high light and yeah. It just my yeah. additional question. It has to do with the experiment of the year. It's this one too, huh? Well, yeah, yeah. But the, the, the initial the first one, yeah. The Can you go because I, it's just a curiosity because if I remember correctly, you had a pattern at the leaf level that when you go yes. So when you go from the leaf level to the canopy level, so at the leaf level you see much higher and uh, well, noise. Well, no, not noise. The the. But the daily pattern you see is much more um, clear for cotton, and then the opposite happens at the canopy level. And so it's just whether you have an explanation for that, or it's and so at the canopy level beams actually right. much uh, right. larger amplitude. The the amplitude of the oscillation. It's quite um, substantial the, the way it changes completely. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what we did here. <laughs> we did a we did lot of analysis about um, leaf area, for instance, because when you have a lot of, here, you know, that this leaf area is insane. We wanted to get a signal. I mean, no farmer would be cropping plants at, at that leaf area. 
Uh, Liberia was a, a lot higher in, in cotton. So that could be an option that, you know, you had a lot, lot more plants that were shaded and so they were not responsive to these daylight cycles. I, I, I would have to look at the paper to, 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 to know what was happening here. I don't remember now. But that might be one of the things. That's one of the things we don't know about circadian rhythms too, are like understory plants, less responsive than canopy trees and so on. Well, here we had we had the the soils were at field capacity all the time. Yeah, but I mean, uh, um, but no, it doesn't it doesn't have soil it, it, it doesn't have a dependency on soil moisture. Those those models don't depend on that. I was just wondering whether because I, I guess like these models they didn't necessarily incomplete there, right? And um, so I was just a bit suspicious whether what you call the circadian rhythm as a, as a predictor for these and um, for the variations. Is not just sort of um, variation that is left un unexplained just because the models are incomplete or that they have a bias that that um, that is dependent on the on the hour of the day, but not just because it's the hour of the day, but because there are a lot of other environmental variables that <coughs> vary throughout the 24 hours period. Yeah, that, that that's it. We we always try to come up with lots of different 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 things. Like here, for example, we also were trying to do different modeling experiments, trying to do like artificial network one network modeling. We then something like Pnet, which is you know not. Uh, so we, we we always try to to combine different models because of, of because of that problem that that you're mentioning. That maybe part of it is is just some limitations with with the model rather than a. <laughs> Than a, circadian, than a circadian effect. Anyway, these are the models that people use. Like Boltberry is probably, I don't know, this has like 2,000 citations or something like that. I was looking for the paper the other day, so that, that's how I know. These are, this is like inert system models. That's what people would use. So they're fairly, fairly, fairly widespread. So that's one way that you can diminish uncertainty in, in these models. Like land surface models and so on usually have this. All right, thanks. Thank you.